to get back to you on a number of things. Um, you'll hear a little bit tonight from mayor's advisory uh, team. They're here this evening to share out some information with you and fabulous work they're doing. Outstanding, outstanding on behalf of the Lahaina community. We could not have a more spirited, a more inspired team. So you'll be hearing from them. You'll also be hearing from our director of Department of Environmental Management, who uh, Shane Ogawa, who was here before. Uh, we've been making our way through the debris cleanup. Um, following that, uh, we'll be doing a question and answer session. Um, I almost feel like I want to have Jeremy go first. I haven't seen Jeremy. Uh, but I just want to mahalo him for always reminding us of that need and that value. At this time, we want to invite up Council Member Tamara Paulton. Uh, I know she had another commitment. Um, oh, look, like a ninja, yeah. Just like, come on. Uh, we just really wanted to aloha and welcome her if she wanted to share anything. Aloha mai kapu. Um, thank you so much, um, Mayor and Mahina. Um, there was just one thing that I wanted to share that I had learned um, over the weekend, and it seemed to make a lot of people yep. happy. Um, if your trees are a hazard tree, that means it's a hazard from falling on a work crew or a house or something like that. The tree itself is not hazardous or toxic. And if you want that tree um, that they're going to be removed to be mulched and put back on your property, they can do that. If you want the tree to be cut into logs and, and you can make slabs later on, that's also a possibility of something that they've done in Kula. Um, I've been told that if you've already turned in your right of entry and it's been accepted, it can't be um, amended at that point. But to keep this in mind for when you get your 72 hour scheduling call, at that point you can say, you know, all my trees, I want them to be mulched and put back on the property. Or I have this big mango tree, I want the logs to be slabbed to put into something else. And um, a lot of people seem to like that information. So I just wanted to share it with you folks about the trees they can be kept on your property as either mulch or logs. And if you've already turned in your right of entry and it's been accepted, it's not too late. You can, um, when you get your 72 hour scheduling call, you can um, mention to them all the details that you want at that time as well. As well as they really encourage you to come and watch just in case there's something that they didn't encounter um, or nobody knew about when you were making your map then they can ask you right then and there, person to person, how you want to proceed. So just wanted to share that with you folks. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Tonight, uh, as I said, we have a full agenda, but Department of Health has an important announcement uh, to make. And I have to say, we said this in Kula last night. Last night was our last Kula community update meeting. Department of Health uh, has sent their team over, Dr. Fink, the director, and Kathy Ho here, every week to Maui. So they go to Kula on Tuesday nights, they go home, then they fly back for the Lahaina meeting. They're a state department head and division head coming here every week. So hold a hand for Department of Health. Really appreciate it. Uh, Aloha. Um, I don't know if some of you remember that uh, we were doing lead screening in Kula, and I had said that we were going to do it in Lahaina. Some of you may know we've been advertising. It's tomorrow at uh, Princess Nahi, Nahi Anna, Anna, um, Elementary School, and it's from 3 to 5. Not only can you get your lead screening, you can also get uh, um, your uh, vaccine, your flu vaccine and COVID vaccine. Uh, if you are unable to make it, we're going to do another event here at the Civic Center on the 21st. And um, in the weeks coming, we will um, give you more information. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. At this time, we're going to turn it over to Mayor Bisson uh, to continue on with our uh, agenda tonight. So aloha, lahaina, ohana. Thank you folks again for gathering with us and for allowing us to come into your place uh, so tonight, I'm really honored to introduce um, and to open the floor to our advisory team. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things before uh, they take over uh, and give their reports. 
Some of you may have been at the initial um, announcement when we announced our having an advisory team and what they would be doing. Uh, but for those of you who, who didn't, I, I wanted to just recap a bit. So I asked people who are from this community, people who may have graduated, most of them graduated, I think five of the six graduated from your, your high school right here, Lionel High School. Many of them come from generations here. Not that that's the only quality, but that was one of the many qualities that they're embedded in this community. And they knew uh, things that we needed to know at the county government level. They don't all come from the same groups. And that was on purpose, so that they could represent different interests that made up. Now, did we hit every community here? No, we didn't. Could we have had 12 instead of six? Could we have had 20 instead of six? Yes. We selected a number that we thought was workable because this group, they meet with me every Mondays and every Fridays uh, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., sometimes 6 to 8, depending on our schedules. Um, but it's mostly been that time. That's of their own time. This is a volunteer group. They also meet uh, when they come here to these Wednesdays in addition. They also meet with a lot of you folks in separate groups. Each of them belongs to a, a RSF group. They each have a bucket of the six areas that recovery talked to you about. They each assigned to one. So they meet with their subgroups as well. But the biggest thing I wanted to say that was not intended when I asked them to be on this was to have targets put on their backs. That was not what I intended when I asked them to serve be people that people would walk up to and either say something bad about on social media or among in the community. That's not fair and it's not right. That's not what their purpose was for. It was to give me immediate feedback about things in the community. They didn't know what they were signing up for either. So the last thing they should be getting from anybody is grief about decisions that they don't make. The decisions are made by me and the guys that work with us. They give us input. And that input is, comes from this community. So I want to apologize for anything that they've had to experience because I asked them to help you guys. So they're about to get up and give a report. I don't know what they're going to say because I got to tell you, I don't tell them what to say. If you guys know this group, no laugh, Lori Degama. If you guys know this group, they boss me around. They let me know what's up and where, where my place is. So I value that. None of these folks are pushovers. None of these folks are, are buying what the county is selling or anything like that. They, they, hold us, they hold us to our responsibility. They really do. And I think that's a good thing. This is the first time they're going to report out because people have been asking, hey, what, what does that advisory team do? What are those guys doing? Well, I'll tell you what, they're busting their butts for you guys. That's what they're doing. A lot of work you guys don't see. It happens behind the scenes. So I'm very, very grateful that they um, agreed to come out tonight as well as they do during the week. So I just wanted to give you that. Now, Nesta Ugale, uh, you guys did not meet at that first meeting that we held. Uh, Nesta came on board later. Again, we have six areas. Archie actually had two of the areas, so we separated that out. So each of them had one, one responsibility alone. Economic, they're going to tell you what boxes they had, uh, whether it's infrastructure, community planning, housing, economic, natural, historical, and health and wellness. They're going to tell you which of those they belong to and what they've been doing. And they'll, of course, try to answer questions later too. But I want to thank Nesta who came on board. Uh, as one of ours as well, uh, one of our me members. So I don't know who's going to take it over. Is Laurie the MC? Is it Calico? Nesta, you want to go first? Everybody, Nesta Ugali. Thank you, guys. Hello, everybody. Aloha. Like Mayor said, um, I'm kind of the last addition to what's been uh, comfortably known as the Lahaina Five, now there's six, right? Gotta have that six man on the bench kind of a guy. Um, really, it's just an introduction to myself to all of you guys, for those of you who I don't know, and to those of you who I do know. Um, as far as the bucket goes, <clears throat> when I came on there, I didn't understand really what that was, and perhaps 
just like you. I still don't really understand what that is, but I want to learn and I want to continue to contribute and be a voice for everybody. Um, for those of you who do know a little bit about me, I think we'll start kind of from the backwards part of it. If you see me in the community, probably it might be in the same shirt with a microphone singing something, right? But really when it comes down to it, my passion is always gonna be my voice. And my voice is gonna be what my instrument is to project to the world, essentially. I am a, from an immigrant family. My great grandfather came and landed in Oluwalu long, long ago. And today, four generations later, here we are. Um, so everything that I know is of the immigrant experience, like some or many of you in the crowd today. I grew up here in Lahaina, went to school at Sacred Hearts, then went on all the way through up to Lahaina Luna and enjoyed my time over there like many of you. Um, so that's kind of the community that, I, that I'm from, right? So a lot of you guys, if, uh, I spent some time as a teacher up there as well. And I think what's important to know about, note about that is those are all the things that I come to this group with, really, um, as a student leader, spending time at the Capitol lobbying as a 15-year-old as a is something that I enjoy doing from early on, something that I can't do today, but something we, we try to. And then after going to school and coming back, like many of, um, many of you or you hope your kids and like, you know, my best friends over here who can't come back, essentially after living in Lahaina for a little while, I too got priced out, right? Because of this fire, so many people are displaced and having to move to Kihei, Wailuku. It didn't take a fire for me to get kicked out of this place, right? Priced out long time ago. And even though I don't live and reside in Lahaina, my heart, my identity, everything I stand for is still Lahaina. And this is replicated all over the place. Anybody who spent anything from a week to a month to a year, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, you just end up loving this place, right? So essentially what, what I wanna share with you guys in the bucket, <clears throat> I think it's, it's, it's really hard to be one person or six people and to replicate the voices of many, or let alone be an elected official to make the decisions for everybody. And so we try to delegate, we try to collect all the information that we can, and then we funnel, and then we share. If there's one thing that I, that I want to share, I guess my, I was, um, it's infrastructure is the bucket that I'm going to be moving into, okay? And I hope that any idea or, or thoughts that you guys have, please reach out, always. Um, and, and we'll go from there. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert at all, but we have people in the field that are. So utilize myself and everybody else on this um, committee here, but I just wanna say aloha to you guys, and um, I, don't, I may not know you, but I love you very much. Thank you guys. Um. I didn't grumble this time, but I'm still up here. Hello, I am Lori Lady Gama. I am born and raised in Lahaina. My uh, family background is my grandparents, my mom and my uncle ran a store on Front Street called Hapo Store. Uh, later on, me and my husband opened No Koi Deli. We had that for over 20 years. And now my daughter is up at Lahaina Luna High School, and so I am Lahaina Luna High School PTSA president. Um, also in the archives, I like to take pictures and preserve. Um, my focus is health and social services. Lori, you get brownie points because we're not supposed to use the word bucket. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> I wanted to just give you guys an update um, on things that we've been working on and finding out in regards to resources. Uh, as far as the kids are concerned, Boys and Girls Club is currently at Lahaina Intermediate and they've started to open up. 
The MEO Head Start uh, is opening tomorrow. You can go to their website for more information. Um, Sacred Heart School just had a blessing at Ka'anapali. They will be having a temporary school there up at the Old Peacock's restaurant. It's the entrance to the bridge that goes over by the fairway shops. Um, also, uh, still the seniors are still looking for the Kaunoa Senior Services um, a West Maui location to have for them. So they're still in search for that. In regards to mental health, they are offering Kanakapila uh, at KBH and Royal Lahaina. There's arts and healing being uh, held at the Royal Lahaina. There's crisis counseling at the non-congregate uh, shelters. Also, they have uh, behavior health being held right down the road over here where the ambulance is at the West Maui Health Services. I recommend people to just go and try and see how it is to talk to someone. Uh, we all are at different levels of trauma. Whether we know it or not is another instance. Um, there's also a um, big event that's going, or a new uh, event coming up for uh, people to have mental health in uh, groups that will reach out to the community and it's more, it's going to be called Wellness with Aloha. More information will come out in regards to that. I also wanna address, I'm sure everyone here can see it. Um, there are more tents on the beach. It's probably doubled in the last week. I have reached out to the county to ask um, what's going on to make sure things, you know, are being addressed there. They've reassured me that Family Life Center has been doing outreach every few days they are going to be reaching out again. There is opening on the other side in the shelters. And we're not turning our back to them. We're not um, cleaning them out of the area yet. We, I wanna just offer help to them and support. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank the mayor for throwing me underneath the bus. I'm the one out of six that didn't graduate from Lahaina Luna. <laughs> Although, I probably spent more time in Lahaina Luna than all these graduates, for almost 40 years in a smelly Lahaina Luna wrestling room. So, anyway. Also, I was told to, to do a PowerPoint, so I guess I'm the only one that followed the rules so far. So. Is this a click it? Which way does it go? Okay, here we go. My bucket is economic recovery, and it's, as you know, it's not really a popular topic when you consider the number of displaced Lahaina residents still in hotels. I sympathize with everyone who is displaced, my family is included. For those of you who don't know me, I've lived in Lahaina for 44 years, and I've been in the retail surf business for about 40 years. I'm going to share with you what I see, know, and hear concerning business on West Maui. Okay, so it's no secret. There's an underlying current that tourists are keeping locals from long-term housing. But like it or not, tourism is our economic driver on West Maui. That could change, but it won't happen overnight. Unless you work for the state or county, we all have some ties to tourism. Now the good news, there is debris cleanup. This is debris cleanup on a house, uh, it's two lots Malka of our home. There are jobs working for the Army Corps or construction companies in phase two, which is the debris cleanup. Folks who I spoke to start at $66 an hour if they're working in the debris footprint. Overtime is $89 an hour and Sundays is $130 an hour. They work 12 hour days and work seven days a week. This is my neighbor across the street. You can see his, his lot is clear. So what does that mean? That means we have a lot of construction jobs that are be coming online. Once all the lots are cleared, the plans approved, and insurance money is released. And then you say, okay, I saw your neighbors. What about your lot? Well, here's my car in our house. I was late to the party with my ROE 
I was so worried about telling my neighbors to get their paperwork in. But hopefully we'll be, hopefully we'll be down the, down the line. But anyway, here's some more good news. Wow. Did I, did I get, uh, I got gonged. They told me they're going to gong me if I went too long. <laughs> okay, that's where we're at. Okay. I guess somebody doesn't like Bank of Hawaii. Okay. Anyway, here's some new construction that seems right around the corner. A new Bank of Hawaii building and a fork and salad next to the line of Canary. That's not, not, that's not my type of restaurant, but I work with some healthy people who love that stuff. It's another win right here. So, yesterday, Mala restaurant opened. I happened to drive by when they opened, and uh, now hopefully my middle son can get back to work. Anyway, there are other, yeah. Now, there are other restaurants adjacent to Mala. I'm not sure if they're opening, but I did see, because I like soda, I did see a bunch of Coca-Cola trucks at Old Honolulu. I'm not sure if that means anything, but that was good news to me. Okay, Leilani's. Restaurants have been a bright spot on West Maui. Because we have a lot less eating choices, restaurants like Leilani's are doing really good, which I think is awesome because Leilani's at Kanapali Beach is part of TS Restaurants, which like a lot of local restaurants, run the front line feeding people in the early days following the fire. Businesses like TS are great community partners with sponsors, teachers of the month, fundraisers, and provides food to many local events. Okay, I did run into Laura Blair. You guys probably know her. She's a longtime hostess at Chemo's, who has now trans transitioned to Leilani's. Chemo's was the landmark restaurant, as we all know, on Front Street. And Laura is kind of a landmark, too. She, uh, she was a surfing legend, having recently been inducted into the Hawaii Waterman Hall of Fame, of which Archie Kalepa is a member of that. But as a hostess, the reason I put her up there, she's, uh, she sees visitors all the time. She's the front line. She says the visitors she sees are here to support our island and are sensitive to our situation. That's when she's working up at the main entrance. When she's down at the beach entrance where the Lahaina Strong protest tents are set up, visitors get mixed messages like they shouldn't be here or almost feeling guilty for coming to Maui. And I've heard that from other businesses as well. Visitors are saying maybe we shouldn't have come. Speaking of Kanapali, I know the West End, Sheraton, and Hyatt are still housing their employees, including workers from FEMA, the Red Cross, and the Army Corps. I think maybe the West End has about 30% occupancy of tourists right now. So the rest of the occupancy is workers, their workers are federal and Red Cross workers. Sorry, I had to work in a shameless plug of our store here. Pardon me. But uh, so th their occupancy is 30% visitors. And that's about the type of business we're doing now. We're doing about 30% of what we did pre-fire. But I will mention that our vendors have been awesome, and we have given over 10,000 pieces of new clothing and slippers at our main store in Kahului. In fact, if any of you need slippers, we still have plenty of leather and rubber slippers for free. So I did speak to some West Valley visitor activities to get a temperature check six months after the fire. Obviously, this is zip lines. And a general manager told me, and I quote, our sales are down about 75%. We need tourists. And my employees need a lifeline. The great community partners, Trilogy Excursions, they've been in business for going on four generations in Lahaina. I spoke to one of the family members. This, uh, this boat, uh, T6, they lost in the fire. But because they're able to operate out of Malaya and Kanapali, they're doing about 60 to 70% of what they used to do. Other charter boat companies, the ones that still have boats, said they're maybe doing 50% of free, free, free fire business. He also mentioned some unique challenges they're having, such as having no fuel access on the west side. He also mentioned, and I quote, the negative community sentiment as possibly having an effect on future business. And he did go on to say one third of their employees also lost their homes in the fire. Another great community partner is Kapalua Golf. I did speak to a representative of Kapalua Golf. And as you guys know, Kapalua has been proactive with our community. 
They've had a couple of free events for local families that have drawn three to 400 people. They gave rental clubs to locals when they reopened uh, one of their courses a month after the fire. They have lowered, I don't play golf, but this was impressive. They have lowered their rates for locals to $75 at the Bay Course and 109 at the Plantation because regular rates are 279 and 459. They are, they are approximately 30% down the number of players in January. And I quote what this uh, spokesman said, he said, the recent century tournament showed the world we're in a position to provide a, a normal vacation experience. And I don't know if you saw it on TV, but that was a great advertising for our island. And I might add, the owner of cop, the, the golf course is working with the county. They have 50 temporary modular homes placed on his golf course for their employees, and he will pay for anything. And finally, I leave you with this. We've had a, we've had a nonprofit for youth sports since 1997. Five years after, after the fire, we started selling Rebuild Lahaina t-shirts. We've raised enough money to help a lot of youth leaders and coaches and sports programs. Here's a sampling of what we've been able to do. We placed 24 sets of basketball uniforms for Lokahi and Lahaina Youth Club. Yeah. We purchased shoes for Lahaina Intermediate School Wrestling Team. We gave handshake Jerry Lopez surfboards to the five families who were competing in our surf bash and had lost everything in the fire. Finally, we help sponsor skateboard giveaways and, and demos at the Lahaina sk Skate Park and Citizens Church. Lahaina is a very special community, and I think we all want to see it alive and well again. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a nice round of applause for Mr. Kim Ball? I just wanted to share really quickly, the reason why you see activity next to Old Line and Luang is because they're looking to reopen Aloha Mix Plate in the same old location right there across. No definitive date yet, but it's definitely coming back. If you're on social media, you can see their update. Archie Kalepa. Aloha, everyone. You know, I've been coming here for weeks and seeing the same old faces. Can you guys give yourselves a round of applause? I'm going to tell you why that's so important. Because this is where you find transparency and communication. If you're not coming to these meetings, for lack of better words, you're not being completely informed about what's happening. So I want to thank you for coming to these meetings. Well, what I'm about to share with you guys is probably the biggest thing on everybody's mind, housing. I'm going to tell you, these six people working with them two days out of the week, maybe four hours a night, eight hours a week, has been, we've had our challenges because we don't wanna fill this community. I cannot tell you how afraid we were to come up here and speak to all of you two months ago because we had nothing to share. It was all about possibilities. What I'm about to share with you guys tonight might help some of you. 
interim housing project list, total interim housing MOU, we have 500 million. County of Maui project, we have 40 million. FEMA, we have 250 million. State of Hawaii, we have 150 million. Hawaii Community Foundation, we have 50 million. CNHA, 5 million. And other plant piece, 5 million. I'm going to go into the projects. County TDU vacant properties to be initiated real soon, 200 units. Lani Opoko, phase one, state of Hawaii, 270 homes. Lani Opoko, phase two, state of Hawaii, 230 homes. Leali, this is uh, FEMA, is working with them. FEMA is completing the design, uh, 200 homes. FEMA direct leased, secured units, 1,362 units. Kanapali 2020, designed to be completed in January. FEMA, 213 units. Waikapu Country Town, it's on hold, but they're slated to do 400 units, FEMA. Maui Lani Fairways, it's in design. HCF, 49 units. Post Housing Support Program in Progress, CNHA, 416. Kako Maui Housing Program, just started, CNHA, 50 units. Forgivable ADU Program, to be initiated very soon, 40 units. That brings us up to 3,262 units. Some of these projects might be subject to change. We all have questions, Jeremy, <laughs> Kai. Our job, the mayor's advisory team, is to work with the counterparts, the professionals. Me, I work with the um, director of housing and so forth all of these guys it's, and really what we do i've worked with fema on discussing some of the housing projects for west maui and the importance of making sure we do it in west maui first because that's what our people want they want it here <laughs> they're listening <coughs> i'm going to tell you this job has not been easy because I know what is at risk. Losing our community, losing these faces. I don't know if I can deal with that. I know for myself, I'm giving 110% to the end. What we need is we need this community to stand behind each other, support one another. It's the real struggle. I'm asking you to be with us. I want us to have some wins. Mayor wants to have some wins. Governor wants to have some wins. This advisory board who does not get paid demands wins from them. I'm really, really hopeful. And I know it's going to happen. In the next three months, you guys will see projects begin to get off the ground. The other thing, 
the properties, the amount of properties that have been cleaned in such a short time is a sign we're going to be moving. We are going to be moving. I hope and I pray that we can get the rest of the people in this community, in this gymnasium, every Wednesday to be part of the process and part of this community moving forward so that we all can go home. Thank you. Uh, aloha mai kako, uh, ovau o kaliko lehua store, uh, noho vau ma lea lii, uh, I think at the time, uh, noho vau ma hayet. Um, I first want to say there's some people in, in the room that really make up this kuleana that I will share out right now. So um, from the corner over here, uh, within my kuleana of this advisory committee, I help to be a conduit for natural cultural resources. And within that has uh, our cultural monitors. So I really have to give it up to our makua, Anakala Kea Moku Kapu, my mom, Makala Pua Kanuha, because uh, <laughs> we are the generation after them that just follows suit. And so we don't have a game plan, we just watch the roadway. And so part of that uh, makeup within this focus is our cultural. And so Anakala Kea Moku, uh, has taken, the, taken it by the horns from the very beginning, and you, it looks like cultural monitors. And so within that, he, Awamu, he carries that kuleana, and that has been a footprint all over this town, uh, six months in and then some. And uh, within also my circle of friends, my childhood friends, people I grew up with, the people I work with, the kupuna that I'm a part of. Uh, I grew up here, I played for this team called the Ladybugs. Uh, and way back when we were the Bad News Bears, and it later became the Lahaina Luna softball team. And they were kind of hammers. But um, I was raised by these gentlemen, uh, Coach Earl Kukahiko Jr., Coach Glenn Gasman, Coach Brian Yamamoto, Coach uh, Togo. Um, amazing. And the reason why I bring up their names is because I don't, definitely don't stand here alone. I was under their leadership at the age of 10 and I'm still under their leadership, right? And uh, so we seek out their mana'o, we seek out their guidance. And uh, within that, I have to share with you that I have a, a hui of friends and I call them the subcommittee. So they are made up in the, you know, they're my childhood friends, but they're made up in Maui Electric. They're made up as carpenters. They're made up in the kako'o. I have a, a new Hanai sister. Her name is Jackie. She never knows she belonged to my family, but she got to follow suit now. She's what they call a scriber, but really what she is is she's the, the gopher, the person on the ground. And I only know how to do things like a he'e. So when my friends talk to me, we just disseminate, delegate, and execute. What does that mean? It doesn't come back perfect, but somebody is demanding a win. And so to the subcommittee that we go to bed saying good night and good morning to each other, to all the things, Shannon, Jackie, Jeremy, you know, Mikey, to all of you folks that keep it real. And part of that subcommittee, before I get into this, is we talk about all the things. Legislation open, Eric, Nestor, legislation open. We don't know nothing about legislation, but we divide and conquer and we go learn. And that's exactly what my friends and our families do within this subcommittee. We don't know, we go find the answer. We don't know the people, we go knock on their door. So I wanted to share that because what I'm gonna share with you is not because I, I'm a subject matter expert, I'm not. But we, have, we are willing to listen and we're willing to get over ourselves and not take it personal and go out and find the answer. So with that being said, the kuleana that I have here is natural culture resources. And so to mahalo to the county. Within this group, we meet once a week and it's the feds, the states, the county, and then us. 
And what we've come up with is when you talk about this Office of Recovery, you're talking about not things that are being recovered now, but you're talking one year, five years, 10 years. So we're really just taking out a canvas and, and setting up a roadmap of some sort. So what I'm going to read to you is not the one all be all, but I'm going to read to you the things that have been heard, the things that have been felt, and now the things that are getting on paper so we don't forget about it. So I'm going to read this to you, and, and it is the Camp Contaminant Samplings, Testing, Reporting, and Monitoring Project. So that falls under this bucket, and it is under the lead of Department of Health. I got to give a shout out to our nonprofits for the Huyo Kavai Ola. Those are my awesome friend, Tova Calendar. I call her and she says, Kaliko, the samples are in the mainland and we're waiting for results. So it all starts with relationship, right? Other, another thing is the restoration of Mokuula um, and Loko uh, or Mokuhinia in Lahaina. So we know that that is something. So to our kupuna of Lahaina, it's on the table, right? And they're going to wait for it to be on the table until our kupunas come to the table. Number three is the restoration of Malu Ulu Olele, the Ulu groves near Lahaina. That's a conversation. Number four is establishing compost facilities. So mahalo to all of our ohana that are green waste mindful. It's on the table. Number five, establishing a native plant nursery for revegetation of burn areas and increased biodiversity. Number six, yeah, go ahead. Because, yeah, you don't build the forest, the water ain't going to come. Uh, number six, watershed restoration projects. So we all live in a watershed. A watershed simply means what goes from the top all the way to the ocean. It's a watershed. So everything in it is what we're being mindful of. Number seven, updating wildfire management plans. So that is being a conversation that's on our table. Number eight, stabilization of damage historic structures and their subsequent preservations, restorations, rehabilitation, and or reconstruction. So that is a mix of our, our kupuna, our cultural monitors, our families, um, and then our subject matter experts. Number nine is West Maui Greenway. Number 10 is our coral reef restoration. And so these are those focus points. A little ave out of that is we also talk about within our groups what happens to the nets that break where people leave NCS, they leave the program, they go back to their home, the landlord give them an eviction notice, and then boom, they don't, they don't belong to any one program. It's not in this focus point, but it is on our hearts. And so what we do is we go find the answer. And so these are the subjects that, these are the conversations that are had 24 hours a day. And it is to uh, community members that are sitting here that they deserve too. We're one of six of hundreds of us that always give input and find solutions. So uh, with that being said, mahalo to everybody. And those of you that we are, you know, a hui, we're all a hui. So mahalo ya oko, aloha. Hello. Hello everyone, I am Rick Nava. I am a graduate of Lahaina Luna High School. I also lost a home up in Lahaina Luna, um, Kilauea, Mauka too. We, my family moved here actually in 1970. My, my grandfather moved in 1931. My father followed Rosa in 1965, 1970. We arrived and I'm told that I was one of the tallest Filipinos they've ever seen. So I don't know what happened there, but anyway, I speak Ilocano. Um, I understand Tagalog, and I'm you know, very active in our community. My, um, my focus is in community plan, and um, I've been talking to a lot of the people, what's happening, especially to the people that wrote the, um, the West Maui Community Way Plan. Um, fortunately, one of the ladies in that, um, who was um, involved with the book is um, the plan, I should say. Kate Bystan is now the new planning director. So I will be working with her closely. In the meantime, actually, even though um, we have our own kind of like responsibility, all of us here actually are like Swiss knives. When something comes up to us, we take it on. We just kind of like, you know, recently we've had been a lot of cases with, with, the, um, with the housing. And we've gotten to know these people. They've gotten to know, you know, especially the first, the first few times, we, I mean, a few weeks we were in the um, responsibility we, well, I was getting called like 11, 12 o'clock in the morning, which was okay with us. And, um, you know, Laurie 
talk a lot about um, mental health. Um, probably most of you know me with my involvement with the Rotary Club with the youth. I've always been, been very focused with our youth. The, um, the housing, sure, it's a big deal. You know, our economy, we got to get going. But sometimes, you know, we ourselves, we forget about our own mental health, our youth, and as well as the um, health care. And this is where, because of um, my involvement with the Rotary Club, I'm so glad that the West, um, the Boys and Girls Club will be opening here soon in Lahaina. But through our Rotary Club of Lahaina and the Rotary Club of Los Altos, we hope to provide them a van that we'll be, we'll be purchasing for them. So we can work with that. And again, like um, you know, Kim here was saying, the, the work that we do with the community, with the youth, because you know, we need to continue to look out for our youth. They are our future. Um, you know, I really kind of, like I said, we're Swiss Nash. We got a lot of things going on with um, in my involvement also, and that's the reason why I'm kind of like dressed up here. I was at a meeting in the county building at 10 o'clock this morning. From there, I went to attend the meeting with the, um, the CEO of Hawaiian Airlines and um, Alaskan Airlines with the merger. And there's a lot of things um, going on. And the island is really, economy is moving in, but like again, I kind of like echo to what Kim had said, and the same thing with me, because I have a lot of friends, Rotarian friends, that would like to come here, but out of respect for us here, they still do not know what they're coming here. But the beauty of that is that whenever they're coming here to Maui, they actually have a check for me, payable to the Rotary Club that we've been able to use to help with, with, our, with our kids. Um, so the one thing that I would like to share with all of you guys here right now, and I've been reaching out to people there, but nobody's taking up on it. I know, especially our um, educators that lost their classroom at Camp Third School. Our teachers, they need classroom supplies. So if there's any teacher here right now, and you need classroom supplies, send me an email. We can get you classroom supplies, okay? We're also helping out with, with of course, our kids with, um, you know, with school supplies. We need to do all of that. So, but you know, again, going back into, into the planning, there's, there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, I know I said this previously at our first speech when, when President Biden came here and he had said that we will build you a better community, which is great. But what we really need to do is have a safer community. To me, that is so, so important that our roads were able to get out of those roads in and out. You know, especially in Mill Camp, if you guys do not know what Mill Camp is like, you know, I'm looking into this soil, so we, we need to do that. And as I'm looking at um, my mentor here, Donna and Bush here, thank you so much for always being here and supporting us. And my classmate over here, who I could always ask and get some answer, Kai Palayo, he and I actually were classmates, even though I'm younger than he is now. So, uh, so anyway, I mean, we could go on and on and on. And again, it is an honor for me to be with um, with all the five of us here. But again, even though we have our own area of where we could help, you know, give us a call. We'd be more than happy to, to do it right now. Again, let's take care of each other. Be kind. Let's commit random acts of aloha. And together, we will rebuild a safer community. So again, aloha. Okay, so now you know why we selected this group. Yeah, how about a nice hand for our advisory team? They are a bunch of real quality folks. They probably could have explained more and more. We tried to keep them to a certain time so we can leave enough time for our next presentation, um, which I know a lot of you are interested in knowing about the final debris site uh, possibilities. And then, of course, we're going to open up to some questions. Uh, if you guys can hold on to your questions, if you have any for our uh, advisory team, I just want to say thank you again. Uh, great job, you guys. Um, Shane, I want to I wanna invite Shane Agawa to come up uh, next, and he will. He's our director of environmental management, and he'll explain to you. Uh, well, he'll make his presentation to you. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. My name is Shane Agawa. I'm the director of environmental management. I've been presenting here several times already. 
I apologize for the mass I've been feeling under the weather recently. Um, tonight, I'm going to give an update and, and explain to you folks the process of selecting the permanent debris site for the Lahaina debris. <clears throat> Normally, I don't use my notes very much, but uh, tonight I'm going to have to rely on my notes. So, the first several slides or slides that we presented before to you is just to give you a little bit of background of how this process evolved. This slide here shows that we initially started with a selection of six locations. Well, initially we started with hundreds of locations. We had a team called it the infrastructure team, along with our federal state partners, consultants, our SMEs, we worked together. We narrowed it down to the top six or six viable locations. We heard from the public and then we added two more. So we became with this list of eight that you see here. I'm not gonna go in detail to each of these locations because we already hashed, rehashed this over and over again. But for those of you who are not familiar with these locations, we do have some exhibits in the back that we can explain in a little bit more in detail. So I'll just run down the, the locations first. There was a location, Bishop Estates, and this is not in any particular order. Bishop Estate property is south of Lahaina Luna Road. There's a Central Maui landfill. I think we all know that. Crater Village, for those of you who don't know Crater Village, it's somewhat Mauka of the Wahikuli area and north of the public schools. There's Makila Nui, which is a Lanipoko property, the Oluwalu landfill area. Ukumehame, which everybody I think is familiar with the EPA using that site as a hazardous material storage area. What we're calling the Wahikuli area, it's uh, lands directly Mauka of the Wahikuli subdivision and the Waikapu quarry, which was one of the locations that was su suggested by one of the, the public. This list has been shared numerous times too. This is the criteria that we use, our infrastructure task force team, along with our partners and consultants to evaluate those initial eight sites. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these. Again, if you guys have questions on these, you guys can ask and we can help you. But a lot of these, I wanna make it clear that was based mainly on public health and safety and environmental concerns. We're the infrastructure group we were tasked with a debris site, and this is the criteria that we worked with. I think a lot of you are familiar with this color matrix. This shows the scoring of the different eight locations. The criteria that was listed in the previous slide is on the left, color scoring, and then you have how we rank them by score. And again, this is in the back. If you guys aren't familiar with this, we can share, share that with you too. So the re-evaluation re of sites. So after listening to a lot of public input along the way um, regarding the Oluwalu site, the mayor decided, you know, after listening to the people, Oluwalu is not gonna be the spot for the permanent debris site. So that brought us down to seven. Part of that public input involved these four additional criteria: historic preservation, cultural sensitivity, distance to the coastline, prevailing winds. There were a lot of other things, but these are the main ones that we, we listened to the public. Emails, phone calls, texts, testimony, uh, collaboration with our council members, so we had a process and utilizing this additional criteria along with the original criteria that I explained before, our selection team and scoring team narrowed down from the seven sites down to these three potential sites. So the first site is the Wahikuli area, which I mentioned that is Malka of the Wahikuli subdivision, Crater Village, which is Mauka of the Wahikuli and Central Maui Landfill. So before I go into each area specifically, 
I just want to say, and I want to really reiterate that there is no perfect site. This has been mentioned before. Not one site is going to make everybody happy. It's been a difficult decision. It's been a difficult process. A lot of hours, a lot of experts, a lot of discussions. One thing I'd like to, to share with you, if you folks didn't see this testimony, but it's from a very Akamai young man from Lahaina, and his name is Paele Kiyakona. Very impressive young man, very knowledgeable, very articulate. And what he said in one of his testimonies is that we should not hinder progress. We do it the right way as best as we can, but we need to progress and we need to move on. So being said, this process that we're doing is helping this community to move on, to put the, disposal, the debris in a safe disposal site. Based on the re-evaluated scoring criteria, we're gonna share with you some of the advantages and disadvantages of each of these potential sites. The reason why we're sharing this with you is that we want to help you to or give you things to think about before we ask for your input. And we will ask for your input on these selections. Your input is going to help our team to select the final debris site or the permanent debris site. Excuse me. So keep in mind the scoring team Along the way, we acquire more information, more updated information. We never stop looking at the different sites. Things change daily. We gather new information. For example, the status of land acquisition. We need to vet through lands that are not owned by the county. If they're lands that are owned privately or by other government agencies, we have to vet through that. And I'll use, hold on, I'll wait till we get to Crater Village. So, Waikuli. Oh. This parcel here, shade, uh, outlined in blue, is the parcel we were calling the Waikuli parcel. Below that is the actual Waikuli subdivision, Kanyao Road, Waikuli Road, Fleming Road is flagged out there. That red line you see is what we call the UIC line, the Underground Injection Control Line. We've mentioned that before in our scoring criteria. That line designates potable water, groundwater. Above that, Malka is the potable water. Makai is the non-potable or brackish water. So that was one of the criterias in all of our scoring of these different sites. The advantages of this Waikuli area is near the temporary disposal site that's in Oluwalu. It is government owned. It's owned by HHFDC and the land is undeveloped. The disadvantage of this parcel is that it's slated for future housing. It's also near the coastline and it's near existing residential areas. The next site that we're looking at is Crater Village. As I mentioned, what's shown in the outline in blue here is the Crater Village parcel. Right below it, and it's cut off right now, is the Wahikuli parcel. So it's the parcel just Malka of the other parcel that I showed. The advantages of this parcel, again, is near the TDS site. It's government owned. It's undeveloped land. And there is the ability to site away from residential areas. This parcel is 500 plus acres. Now, what we show here that's Hatch is just an example of where the site could be. Again, I was going to use Crater Village as an example as to how things can change, how the criteria and the scoring can change as more information is being given to us. So, for example, if the landowner, it doesn't have to be a government agency, any landowner, if they say to us, okay, you guys are looking at the site here because you want to keep it away from residential, the public schools, but we're going to use this land for development, etc. We need you to put it here where the, where the reservoirs are. 
Well, that's new information to us that we have to take into consideration in our scoring, in our evaluation. If the land owner says you only have this area to use, do we really want it there because of the proximity to residents and school age children? If we say we want it up here and they come back and say, no, that's prime land. Again, new information to us on how we use this parcel, how we score this site, it may drop the scoring. That's just an example. Central Maui Landfill is the third option. Outlined in blue here is the footprint of the whole Central Maui, what the county owns. The advantages of Central Maui is undeveloped land. It's planned already for a future landfill site. It's away from residential areas and it's below the UIC line that I mentioned earlier. So it stands above non-potable, non-drinking water. The disadvantages of this site is it's far from Oluwalu, the TDS, and there's going to be, we anticipate major traffic impacts, which includes roadway safety. So that's some of the things that you need to keep in mind when we ask for your input. So how do we get your input? What's the plan? So as I mentioned earlier, our team is gonna to look to the public to assist us in helping us to select the permanent disposal site. Our plan is to accomplish this with a survey, a community survey. This survey will take your input and you may ask, how does this survey gonna make a difference? This survey is not gonna be you select site one, site two, or site three. This survey is gonna allow us to get feedback on how the public gives importance to different criteria of the different site. We take the input, we apply that to our criteria scoring as our infrastructure or our scoring team, and then we rescore it with the public input. I'd just like to say that our team also enlisted the help of professional consultants to assist us with this. We couldn't do this on our own. It's too huge of a task, too much data, uh, too much time constraint. Um, you know, we have a consultant helping us with the survey. We have consulting uh, consultants helping us with analyzing the data and moving forward with this selection process. So now the timing of all of this. January 1st today, we present to the public our strategy to move forward with selecting the permanent disposal site. The survey goes live today. I think it is live. We allot about two weeks for the community to take the survey. You can take it online. We have a QR code that will be provided. You also can take, uh, we, I think we have a random phone survey selection. Um, you can get information on how to do this. We have people in the back to help out too. After the survey closes, after two weeks, we take about a week for our consultants to analyze the data. About a week after that, or two weeks after the survey closes, we're gonna share the summary of the results. We're gonna make the results of the survey public. How we do that, we're not sure yet. We're looking at maybe the Maui Recover site, or other means to share that data with you, but we're gonna to be totally transparent as to the results of the survey. Now, this is the important date, March 1st. That is the date that we are targeting to make the final selection on the permanent disposal site. Why March 1st? Well, there's concerns about the debris being left at a temporary site in Oluwalo. We've heard that from the community. We have concerns ourselves it's a temporary site. It's not meant to hold the debris for years and years and years. So we really need to find a final site that's designed to contain this debris. There's also concerns that maybe we might lose some FEMA support, whatever that may be. FEMA supported the TDS. They are not supporting the final site. And they are also supporting the transport from the TDS to the permanent site. 
But we can't expect FEMA to be here forever and ever supporting us. There's no real time frame, but we got to show that we are trying to find a permanent site for this debris. This is the QR code. If you take a mobile device and you scan it, and we have it in the back too, and we have people to help you, you scan the code, it'll take you directly to the survey. Um, I believe there's about 13, 14 questions roughly around there. Again, this information is gonna help us decide where the final or the permanent debris site will be. This is the last slide. Um, again, I'm sorry about kind of being herky-jerky, relying on my notes. I normally speak from the heart. I just want to say that although I'm the face of DEM and being up here presenting, this culmination, this process consists of efforts from a huge team. This is not an easy decision. This is not taken lightly. We had support from federal partners, state partners, consultants, the mayor's office, other departments, input from the public. Hours and hours. We all here are county short staff. That is a fact. Our department is short staff. I've seen our employees working on this day after day, hours after hours. Me personally, I just like to give a shout out to my wife and my kids. They have been very patient. I'd like to give a shout out to all of our team's families because of the hours and hours that they put in. Our partners from the mainland who came over and spending months here away from their family. I just want to express to you how important we take this decision. It affects all of you, all of us. As a lot of you know, I'm from Lahaina. I grew up with a lot of you. The reason I'm up here and I'm under the weather is because I care. I want to be here for everybody. I want to be here for my family. I want to be here for my friends. And I want us to make the right decision. And I want you folks to be involved. Thank you. So I think we're going to start taking questions, but I wanted to answer Two things before we get started. Uh, shipping the debris off of Maui is not one of the options. Uh, I know some people feel strongly about that, but that is not one of the options that we have today. I also want to say about the comment the director made, it's not that FEMA is not helping us, it's that FEMA can only help us with temporary projects, which is why they could do the temporary disposal site. They could contract with the Army Corps of Engineers to prepare that site that was not at a cost to the county or the state or to you, uh, but they cannot build the permanent site. The permanent site has to be under the county. Uh, and so they can help us with expertise and with support, but um, the best way they can help us is they can uh, help with the tipping fees or the cost of each truckload that gets dumped in. They can help pay for the truckloads that go up there, which will help us offset the cost of building uh, the site. So I just wanted to clarify those two things before I ask Mahina to take over. I guess we're gonna run two mics. We might have some help from Jackie. You, you guys wanna help us with the mics? Okay, we got them. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, at this time, we're going to see how we can help with any questions you have. Ordinarily, we would run uh, more than one mic because this is a lot of steps, uh, but luckily, Shannon E.E. E. from our Kukua crew is wearing shoes today. <laughs> She's going to help us. And the reason we're only running one microphone is because we're live streaming. So it's got this attachment on the mic, and we didn't have enough to put on all the mics. But uh, we'll have them on order. And the more we do the Q&A sessions, the more prepared we'll be for that. Um, for tonight, uh, just as we did last week, if you have a question about uh, what you heard tonight or something you didn't hear tonight, Normally, our meetings have all of the updates from our federal and state partners who are here with us tonight. We ask them not to do that this evening to allow more time for our 
friends in the advisory committee and also to allow for the presentation by Shana Gawa. So if you don't mind, when you have a question, you raise your hand, I'm gonna call you and the next person after you. Uh, Shannon's gonna give you the microphone and then she's gonna take the microphone back, really, right after your question, so that she can book it over to the next person while our resource folks are answering. Um, hang on just a second. So at this time, please raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, we're gonna go with the gentleman in the green, guy in the blue, and I saw one there on the top with the black shirt, okay? So I'm going to do three at a time because it's really hard to keep track. Sir, please proceed and hand the mic over and we're going to go to the fellow in the blue. Thank you. Are we live yet? Yeah. Got it. Um, I've talked with some of you gentlemen already about a proposal to separate the ash from the soil. We know that most of the toxins are in the ash layer and less toxins are in the soil. And we go to move it and deal with it later if we deal with the ash separately, where most of the toxins are, it's important in triage to deal with that first and with more technology than the soil. Can anyone please address that and uh, see if we can move that proposal forward? Colonel Curry. Yes, sir, thank you for the question. So I know we've talked about it uh, at length. Uh, the, the reality is separating the ash from the first little bit of the soil that's on each property the extra time that it would take to do that is is not worth the separation of, of those that ash from from the soil. I would emphasize that all the debris, all the ash that is going to the temporary debris storage site, is going to the absolute best place for it to go temporarily until the permanent debris storage site is established. So as as that that site is today is performing exactly how it was designed, it's performing well. That debris is coming off of properties in Lahaina. As of today, we've got 30 properties that have had all the debris removed. There's 10 crews out there working right now. Um, well, it's dark outside, so they're working, they're working every single day to get that off of those properties and into a controlled environment as quickly as possible. The extra steps that we've talked about would certainly slow that all that material would still go to the temporary debris storage site, so do not believe that that would be effective and worth that, ex that extra time in order to try to separate the ash from the soil underneath it. Thank you, and I, I appreciate everybody's volunteer work um, and, and all the work that everyone's doing. Uh, this is a bit of a long question, so I'll try to stay quick, but uh, as a staunch defender of Oluwalu, I understand why we don't want it there, but I've not been able to fully um, understand a good, realistic alternative, except for one, and I have not gotten a good answer for this. So the Central Maui landfill, <clears throat> there's the 20 acres that I believe the county is planning to purchase or, or take over by eminent domain that property they wish they had previously. So if the eminent domain, and I know those discussions are happening now, you eminent domain the 20 acres, the quarry site, um, I've, I've heard that, well, if they protest the purchase price, I could delay it. I think legally we know that they can't, the, the county could have access to that immediately. So you have access to the 20 acres. I understand it takes a year to do a permanent site, but you could do a temporary site there in 45 days. Yes, FEMA might not pick up the tab because they've already invested in a temp site, but you could, because in 45 days you could move, you could bypass all of them, go directly to Central Maui Landfill. You don't have to move all of that debris that didn't make it to Olawalu a second time. So I think there's a cost savings there. So I don't buy that. The cost is an issue. The traffic is the last point that I think people will say, well, it's too much traffic. Could you move these at night? So you imminent domain, you do a 45 day temp site in central Maui, and then after 45 days, you bypass Olawalu. I brought this up weeks ago could be halfway through a temp site there. So I haven't heard good reason why that is not an alternate. Thank you. 
So, as I mentioned, things are evolving. You are correct. At one point, the county was looking at acquiring that 20 acre parcel. However, with new developments, what we've been told, and we're still getting this to our core council, is that if the land use for that 20 acres is similar to the land use that we're eminent domaining for, it, historically on the mainland, the courts have no have not agreed on the side of the agency that's trying to eminent domain the property. Now, we have been in contact with the landowners. They have been agreeable to try to work with us. However, the intention of that parcel is also similar to a debris containment use. So we're vetting through that part, uh, that uh, eminent domain process still, you are correct. Now, the part about bypassing the old wall, yes, there is a potential to, to do that. Can we do it in 45 days? I'm not sure. I'm not sure where you got your facts from. I have not heard that we can do it in 45 days, even a temporary site. But I can say that we have shifted our sites at Central Maui to lands that we do own. It wasn't explored before, but in talks and uh, things that came up recently, there is a possibility. We do own 99 acres on the Makai side of the landfill. So there is a possibility that we're looking at taking the debris from Lahaina there. Now, as we mentioned, and as we've heard from the public, everybody wants to be heard. We want people to be heard. We want their input. That's why we have these three sites. If the, the it makes sense to be on Lahaina, that's where the final selection is gonna be. If it's at Central Maui Landfill, that's where it's gonna be and we work from there. But this is an opportunity to get the community's input on where the final debris site should be. Thank you, Shane. Um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first is Clean Harbors offered a proposal to the mayor's office and the Army Corps of Engineers um, about off-island disposal. They are willing to do um, a minority of the work at a heavily discounted price. Why was this information never made public to the community? We have a very deep venture uh, with SAS. Anyone familiar with that? So we're going to ask you one more time. Sorry, could you repeat that? Um, Clean Harbors sent a proposal to the Army Corps of Engineers and the mayor's office offering to assist in the disposal of the Lahaina debris off island at a heavily discounted price. Why was this information never disclosed to the public? I'm hearing this from you right now. I'm not aware of that. So uh, That's directly from the Clean Harbors organization. I have not even heard of that organization, much less of what you just said. I don't know, does the Army Corps have any information? No. Okay, and um, then the second question is for Archie in regards to the FEMA housing. Several people are already being evicted from their rentals to accommodate the FEMA price increases. What's being done to mitigate that? Because that is going to essentially just snowball an issue. I'll start. Um, well, actually, no, sorry, we have FEMA director here. The information I have is the information I have is from him. So, you know, I have to tell you that a tragedy like this, you see the best in people and you see the worst in people. And I don't have to tell you folks because this is what you guys have been experiencing. So yes, there are people that we are told of that when they have gone back to their rental, the landlord has evicted them for whatever the reason. Good reason, bad reason, I don't know the reason just that those people have been told that. FEMA has assured us they will not use that landlord in their direct leasing program. So that landlord is gonna end up losing on that, on that front. The names of those landlords, the names of those landlords will be turned over to the Attorney General's office for legal uh, action as well. I don't know what else we can do to prevent it, except 
Yeah, okay. Uh, that's great, Jen. Yeah, so we're asking everybody to report them. Report the name of that person. If nothing else, well, certainly they'll be shamed once their names are known. Um, and that's not worth the risk in a small town like you folks. But we are hearing about this. It's, it's, it's all over social media, especially today. Um, so the best we can do, am I right, Bob? Okay, he gave me the thumbs up. So the best we can do is ask FEMA. We are not going to, those guys are not going to benefit from that because we're not going to let them rent. We're not going to rent from them. And then, of course, we're going to ask the AG's office to take take action for, for that too. Now, I wanted to say one thing. That That's the obvious reason, but there may be things that happen to cause someone to be evicted other than the person wanting to participate in FEMA. So I'm not trying to put everybody in the same category. We're only talking about those people that are trying to trade up to the FEMA rental program. But there may be other reasons and basis that people, you know, have, have, have separated their things. So I don't want to frighten all the landlords um, for, you know, any legitimate reasons that there might be, but um, certainly on that one. And here's Bob. Actually, you did a great job, sir. Uh, the only thing I was going to add is um, keep in mind there's two programs that we're running. One is direct lease, which we we're entering into the contractual agreement. That one, I guarantee you, if we hear of that happening, we will back out. We will not execute that contract. We need to know, though, um, in order to do that. The second one, though, is rental assistance, where we provide someone 175% fair market rental rate and let them go rent. So if someone else is renting that's been displaced, we know that. And I think that's why it's so important to report it, uh, because there are protections underneath the governor's declaration uh, of emergency. Uh, the attorney general can take action. Uh, and so in order to report it, then action can happen. So we need that to get out on social media, the, the, what's going to happen to people do that. So my question is about um, the housing, or I don't know if it's even a question, but it's important to inform you. So I received yesterday a notice saying that I need to vacate my unit that I'm in by February 5th at 11 a.m. And there's a checkbox list of why and what is checked on mine is because I uh, denied the FEMA direct lease housing that they offered me, which is in, they offered me in Wailuku. The reason I didn't take it, or me and my wife didn't take it, is because, for one, you don't know, they cannot tell you where it is, they only tell you on January. Wailuku is a big area. So how how you be comfortable with but anyway, my main factors for it, for denying it, was have one car to make the commute back to this side, one reliable car. We both work on this side. My kid, my oldest son goes to school in Napili, and my youngest son is not even old enough to go to school yet. So to be that far away from work, their school, was a big reason I had to not be comfortable taking them. What I was told is, if I don't take it, I'll be kicked out of the direct lease program. That was the first call. So I had no choice. What, what am I supposed to do? That was my reason. Then I've been here. I heard from other people like, hey, that's not right. We indeed, we deny it. They told us that we can deny them for those same reasons. And we're just going to pass the offer to someone else. You're going to be pretty much basically put on a bottom of the list. If something else comes up, We'll give you a call to more better fit your circumstance. So that that already got me distraught. Like, how come you got told that and I got told like getting kicked off the direct lease program? So whatever, I was calling for one whole week straight, leaving message after message, no call back, nothing. The only way I got a hold of them, I called five times in a row because nobody didn't answer. Finally, didn't answer. Got a hold of somebody from the direct lease program. Explained to them, and they told me, well, that's the new thing that's going on. Okay. 
So I explained the reasoning. I told him, is there, can I get put back on to the program? Oh, no, you cannot. So I told him, but I'm just not understanding why i giving you these legit factors and you're telling me I cannot. But other people are saying they gave those reasons and they've been, they denied it like two so how come I got one shot and I got thrown out of the program? So she's like, oh, let me look. I don't know what she did. If she has a list right in front of her, offered me a place in my local. Again, I told her, did she not understand what I just explained to you? She told me, oh, it's only temporary. 33 miles is not that far. I told him, you might not understand that on the the island. She said, well, this is all we have. Then she goes to me that we've been on the phone for 35 minutes. Do you have a decision or not? How, how would you feel if you got told that? And then I told him, okay, so if I consider them, I'm not saying, if I consider it, and we go through the process of whoever the person renting the hour, putting up their home for us to stay in, and just so happened, it doesn't fit or I feel like it's not gonna work. I thought about it and it's not gonna work because of those reasons that I just explained. It doesn't matter, you'll get, you'll be kicked out of the program. But she never put me back on the program, she said. Then she also said that if you deny, same like other, if you deny it, you can be kicked out of the direct lease program. So I was like, well, with that being said, I guess I cannot, I, I guess I don't can accept them. In my head, I think he's talking about the rental assistance program that should be able to work eligible for. So I was like, okay, we just gonna work with that. Well, going back to what I just got yesterday about that notice, we never get told with those two conversations from the lease program, so I can get the red program, the red cross program as well. I'm going to be affected in the Red Cross program. Just kicked out of the direct lease program. So I, that's why I've been still trying to look. We've been trying to look to maybe work with the rental assistance program from FEMA. And then we get this notice. I, I'm not understanding. And then when we go to see the help from the Red Cross, they said, oh, your criteria or your, your concerns and the reasoning is all valid reasoning, especially if you don't have one means of transportation. It should be exempt. Well, I talked to them on Sunday. They said they were going to see if it they can help us out. But I still received this notice yesterday. They tell me that in 48 hours, it's up to the state to accept the exemption. So in 48 hours, I talked to them yesterday. They said, come and see us tomorrow and you'll be getting a phone call because it should, you should be getting the exemption. Well, I went to talk to them today. They said they, they, that we are going to be getting a call. All the way up until now, I've been checking my phone all day. My wife and my daughter did They expect a call, no call, nothing, nothing yet. Then they, so we asked her, she asked her, what if I don't get a call? She asked her today, what if I don't get a call? You're going to so adamant that we're going to get a call. Never got it yet. Then she said, oh, if you don't get a call today, you'll probably get one tomorrow. So what, am I, what do I do? Well, do I just sit here and wait? I, I don't have anywhere else to go. I mean, we've been looking. You guys understand the rental prices and everything and how long it's going to take to work with somebody to even rent it to, even if I find one. But right now, I ain't finding anything in our price range. So I guess all I'm trying to say is this is what we're actually dealing with. I don't know if everybody is right now, me and my family. And this is, the information that is going out is misleading. I mean, it's good, good information. I get that you guys, the information is at the best you guys can, I guess. But what is really happening, this is what is really happening, what is being told. And it's like, I'm up against the wall here. I don't know what to do. So do I just keep waiting for tomorrow and see if I get a call or? talk about myself and I just leave me out of the car for, for a little bit. We're going to let, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, glad. Hello. Hello. Here we go. <laughs> 
Uh, first of all, uh, appreciate uh, you know uh, your background and what you're going through, <clears throat> and uh, you know really apologize for the confusion um, that you're enduring. Um, but here's the situation we're in: we have um, over three thousand units that have been lost because of the fire. You have an existing, as you said, um, rental program, uh, rental market in this island that has been uh, further strained and limited affordable rents and, and difficult, and, and I hear you. Um, one of the things we did is went out and leased as many of the vacation units as we could. We're up to about 1,500 units. We're matching those against 1,500 families about seven or eight hundred of them are in uh, the hotel program right now underneath Red Cross. Um, but we need to, that program is limited as far as how long I can sustain you in that program. And so once a unit's available, I'm required to move because I'm leasing the units right now. Um, and it doesn't work where the units are, some are in the west, some are in Kihei, and some are in central Maui. Um, all we were told to get them within 40 miles of Lahaina. I understand the commute distance, but we're in a situation where there's limited resources, and those are the resources that are available if you want a housing unit. What we want to do is work with the most vulnerable first to prioritize them to the west side. So elderly, medical, young children, uh, AFN, uh, you know, those kind of things. So that's why they're trying to work with you, understanding your situation um, and, you know, the one car and work, you know, obviously plays into that. But we're having to balance 1,500 people in one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedrooms. We have some seven bedrooms uh, and big families that we're trying to balance where we can put them, where resources are. The truth is there's not 1,500 properties on the West Coast that we can get. So that means some people if they want a unit, are going to have to go ahead and commute for that unit. We will try to improve that over time. Maybe as we build out these um, temporary housing sites, that may be an opportunity to move closer to that site. But that's the limitation, and that's the reality of where we're at right now in this event. We're trying to do everything we can to improve that. Uh, I've reached out to the housing market a number of times. I reached out to I sent letters to every property owner in Maui now. They probably know my name by heart. And I'm trying to lease more on the west side, but we're limited. That's the truth. There's 1,500 units, they're there. So, you know, what I would do is, one is if you get a call from FEMA and, they're, and you're eligible for direct lease, I would urge you to take that resource because it could last you for some period of time. Um, it's the one program that I can extend depending on what situation you are, a renter, a homeowner, I, I can go ahead and provide you rental assistance for some time. Fully paid by FEMA, including the utilities and you know all the fees there. So furnished, all those kind of things. So we want you in a safe, reliable, sustained housing unit for, for some period of time until we can start the rebuild of Lahaina, until we can either get you for a renter before back in an affordable rental unit um, but the truth is right now there's limited resources. Those are the solutions. Uh, do I wish you got better communication, better responses? Yes. Will I talk to my team about it and make sure we're, you know, addressing people's needs? Uh, you know, I'm definitely gonna go back tomorrow and talk to them. I appreciate you sharing that. But the reality is the reality. And I can't sit here and tell you that there's 1,500 units on the west side. It doesn't exist, right? And so it's about a third, a third, and a third. About a third on the west side so far, about a third in Kihei, about a third in central Maui. We're going to put those that are the most vulnerable closest to where they need to be uh, using some of those criteria and then offer others. If you don't want the unit, then that's, you know, that's not our decision. All we can do is offer the unit. Okay? Thanks. Okay. Okay. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. So, okay, hang on, hang on, have a seat, have a seat. Um, so what, what Mr. Fenton just said is the reality of what units are available. However, 
I would ask you to work with your case manager. Each of you who are at the hotel should have a case manager or what's the other title? A shelter resident transition. We're going to be switching over to case managers coming in with, uh, I think, DHS soon so we can do a better job. What you're right about is it's a very individual situation. And what I'm going to ask everybody tonight, and you know, out of respect for everybody, I think the situation they gave sounded by the applause that it was typical for some other people's experience. If you have an individual experience, come up to us after so we can take that up one-on-one. -on -one. That way, no, 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 don't clap, don't clap, don't clap. I'm just trying to tell you, we can do a better job one-on-one -on -one instead of everybody having to sit through something. If it's that kind of a question, if it's that kind of a question, uh, then we'll take it offline and we'll try to get more individual help for you. Um, so we can fall, track down your hotel and everything and not do that in front of everybody uh, you know, in your situation. Take it up privately and work with them. But I'm gonna ask you guys to talk to your case managers so that we can, uh, they're, they're your advocates. They're the people that should be communicating uh, so you're not having to wait five days for a phone call and all that. We're trying to help you out. When you're done, you come down there, come down here when you're done, we'll take your name, we'll take your information and we'll try to get a direct answer to you and you put a face with the name with one of us, either one of my people or one of those folks. I didn't mean to tell you to sit down. I meant to tell you we'll get to it tonight, okay? But everybody else has a situation. Come up and talk to us about your situation. It might be an easy fix, it might be a hard fix. But you guys are all hearing the reality is you're going to get offered something. It may not be ideal, and there are a lot of reasons why. They are making exceptions. Your kids go to school on this side. Maybe your job is on this side. There's other reasons. You, you got to be close to your doctor. You know, Bob told you all the reasons. Uh, but we got to just get those. We got to connect the right people. That's what we got to do, brother. We got to connect the people to your situation. And each of you who have a different one, I encourage you to come up and tell us so we can try to get ahead of that and you're not waiting in that, in that limbo. Because it's not right. What you're saying is not right, obviously. We all recognize it. Everybody in this room recognizes it. That's why they applaud it. But the question is, how do we solve it? And you solve it by talking to us one-on-one, -on -one, and then we'll get something. We got Department of Human Services here too, so I know, I don't know, Mr. Campos is sitting right, standing right there. He's hearing all this too. His people is coming over here um, to help us with that case management piece. Thank you, Mayor. We'll go here, and then the gentleman in the middle with a green shirt, all of us in the green shirt, and one right green. I don't, I don't have a question. I have a statement and an opinion. I'm listening to Mr. Gawa. Uh, on the three locations for the disposal final. It's a real, it's kind of a no-brainer. The, the perfect location that is going to minimize all the other pros and cons that was listed is number two, create a village. Create a village, you don't have all the traffic to go to Wailuku and haul this stuff over. Number one, Wahikuli. Wahikuli area is under the state jurisdiction that says they're gonna be building more homes there. So do you wanna put rubbish next to the homes? I don't think so. Creative Village is the perfect spot and the trucks that are going from Oluwalo to Creative Village can go on the old plantation road and not even be on the highway most of the way. I've lived in Lahaina for 80 years. I played in Creative Village. I know about Creative Village and it used to be the old dump. It's got plenty of room to hold all this stuff that you guys are moving. So like I say, it's not a question, it's an opinion and it's a, it's, to me, it's a no-brainer. Thank, thank you. And again, we appreciate really you serving to give us that one. Uh -oh. We're going to the yellow with the top middle green shirt, followed by the green. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. And first off, thank you everybody that is working for the recovery of Lahaina. Project. It's unbelievable, but uh, everybody is doing an amazing job, so thank you. Um, I asked a question last week, so I've got two questions, both for Department of Water Supply. Is One, if we could get a detailed update from Department of Water Supply on what they're doing to get water back to Lahaina. 
Um, my second part of that is um, accounts that are units that are not destroyed but are not inhabitable yet are still getting billed the water meter fee and the sewer use fee and I'm hoping that that can be waived until those units have service restored for both sewer and water. Um, obviously everybody's gone through a pretty heavy financial impact and we have owners that are having to pay those fees. Um, the alternative I was giving was to just cancel the account but I would think that it's going to be a huge snafu to have all those accounts re-established afterwards. So, Two parts, one, a, a detailed update, and two, is there a possibility of a waiver of those fees until service is restored? Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna answer part two, uh, question two first. It's easier to cancel the account, and there'll be no issues with reestablishing it. Okay, so as long as you know who you are, you cancel it, we know when you put the meter back, you establish the account. So we don't charge for putting the meter back or anything like that. So you want a detailed on what we're doing. So initially we uh, amended area one, two, three A, three B, four C, and four D. We're still working on four A that should be cleared in about two weeks. The larger areas which are L5 and L6, we'll be starting that next week. So we're uh, gonna ramp up with the help of the EPA um, we hope to get through the remaining L5 and L6 by June. There's a, about 1,500 service laterals and about 15 miles of pipe that we got to test, sample, and cut service laterals possibly if it is contaminated. Um, we might be able to amend smaller areas as we move through and see what, um, what do we get. We might be able to isolate and take a smaller portion, amend that, and keep moving on. Um, it's really, we try to make sure that we stay in the process, we follow our sampling plan, we follow what um, we've been doing so far. Um, we have a pretty good idea what we need to do, and with EPA itself, we're going to get there quicker than uh, we would have if not. Thank you. Thank you. My question is this. Um, I've had the opportunity to drive through Lahaina. It's heartbreaking. I know everyone knows that. But my concern is the amount of concrete and steel that I saw. And I've read previously that the idea is to recycle those, which is lovely. But are they going to either the uh, temporary or permanent done while we're waiting for them to recycle those products? Are we just going to be filling the dump and then having to move these tons and tons and tons of concrete and steel to the off island to recycle? Uh, yes, sir. So thank you for the question. And for the recyclable steel, recyclable concrete, none of that is going to the temporary debris storage site. That's going straight to, I mean, we, we, our contractor will be processing it um, as it goes out of Lahaina, but we'll go to on Maui, Hammerhead, a couple other places where that, that material will be received and processed. So but no, none of that material goes to the TDS. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if this question is for you, Colonel, or for uh, EPA. And I know I touched a little bit on this with uh, Archie during one of our morning coffees, but after the debris removal, which I wanna also add, very grateful for all the work that uh, your group is doing. But uh, after the re removal, uh, you're saying that you're gonna scrape six inches and then test it, and then scrape another uh, six if needs to. Uh, is there a process that maybe we can core before we scrape so that maybe we don't have to go down six, maybe it's just two inches that we might have to handle, but do a core sample to test the ground before we actually do the removal uh, so that, because I know uh, Army Corps is going to put back half and then the other half is responsible of the homeowners, right? So I wonder if that was in any of your uh, procedures. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. And the the process that we follow, again, it's built on the, the previous experiences, all the experts on, on the best way to address this ash. So as we 
identify the footprint of the debris that we've talked about the halo that where that structural ash is and part of that assessment is making making you know clear where that debris you know reduced to and where that soil underneath is going to be contaminated so based on all that we've all that we've seen in other fires that initial six inches is going to include is going to have those contaminants uh, when we finish that first scrape so i think the first part of the answer is you, there, there's not there's not a part of the process to try to to test and again i think for for the process to work smoothly um again it we, we don't believe that would be effective um, when we do the tests i would add though so we actually kind of quadrant off the property and do multiple tests of that so that as those tests comes back come back and are evaluated if we do have to take more material we don't take it from the whole footprint of the house only from the areas you know that are quadranted off to so again to reduce the amount that we need to take if parts of that come back clean but say one part of it or one corner of another, then that's the only place that we'll do the rescrape. And recognizing that you know, that that material is important, uh, so we don't want to remove more than is necessary. But that that that's the process that we've continued to follow, and and we'll we'll continue to communicate with the homeowner each step along the way. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, sir, we're going to go here. Yes. Okay. Good evening. Um, my name is Michael Yamashita. Um, I'm currently living on Oahu, not in Lahaina. Um, the reason why I'm here is to ask for your help more than this. Um, I've been trying to get a meeting with both the governor and also the senator of Hawaii for a long, long time. And the reason why is connected to Lahaina. So I don't want to shock everyone too much, but. Um, my my father was a lawyer, a Japanese lawyer, and uh, um, I come from a very intelligent family. So, what's happened is is that for the last eight years, I have been watching terrorist events that have happened around the world. So, um, everything from the Manchester attack, Paris attack, um, and I have been predicting them, not afterwards. So, it's not conspiracy. I'm actually predicting these things. So Homeland Security gave me clearance to stay in the United States um, a few years ago. And since then, I have been trying to link with the FBI, but I cannot. They have a protocol that states that they cannot look at anything unless it's actually real. Have you seen anything? Have you heard anything? So I have two questions. I'm going to keep this very brief. Um, I need to give my work, which is in a 300-page binder here, um, and it involves most of the terrorist acts around the world, including fires, one of them being Lahaina. I had this fire. I had it in June, and I contacted some people. I, I'm really sorry that it happened, and I really tried. I tried so much to... to to get in contact with so many people, but I had so many people stopping me. So the questions I have is one, will you help me to try and get a meeting with a senator or with the governor of Hawaii? Because I've tried. I tried. Sir, I think we can help you after. Yeah. And the other thing. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. 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 Y
we did have a recycle center. This is why my question is so simple. We did have a, a recycling center here next to the smokestack. As far as I know, it burned up. Do we have a new recycling center here on this, on the west side? so that I don't have to drive to the other side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So the recycling program comes under our department, under our EPNS uh, division, and they have been in contact with the owner and operator of that recycling center. They are trying to find another site on the west side. But as you can imagine, it's a difficult task, but they're trying to work through it. Good evening. Two questions. One more for the emergency management. Um, you notice how beautiful and green the island is coming again, but in a couple of months it's probably going to be dry and a fire can happen again. I would love to know an update about the evacuation routes on the west side. Thank you. Yes, sir. And the other question would be for Bob. Uh, are they going to do modular housing on the west side, especially for people like myself that have pets? It's very, very difficult to find way, but let alone if you have pets. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. I. Um, I do understand the evacuation situation. I, I, you know, I was a firefighter out in Lahaina, and um, it is a big deal for me. Um, I actually was uh, had a discussion with DOE uh, right before this meeting regarding uh, evacuation routes. Um, I can promise you that it is a priority uh, for me, um, and. Uh, uh, looking at whatever grant programs might be available to assist in improving the right uh, evacuation routes. Um, so I, I, I guess I just want to say that it is a priority, priority for me. I, I am working on it for sure um, and talking to a lot of people in how we make those, uh, those things happen faster, sooner than later. Um, you are more than welcome to come see me afterwards. I can share some of those details with you. Thank you. Hey, just to follow up on um, the first part about evacuation that Amos talked about, uh, I was participating on a call today with the fire administrator, the national fire administrator, and you had the chief of Maui Fire on there, and a bunch of other fire chiefs and academic organizations from across the country talking about evacuation and how to help uh, not only your community, but other communities. And uh, there's a number of resources out there and grants. So we'll partner with Amos and, you know, and your fire chief at overtime to help support him uh, on planning and, and how uh, we work together to support you, including incorporating lessons learned. As far as the modular units, um, to pivot here, uh, the modular units, uh, I, uh, Archie did a pretty good brief of kind of where we're headed. Um, we do want to, we are looking at a couple sites uh, on the west side for modular units. Uh, as you know, it's a very complex area to build as far as water, sewer, power, grading of the land, historic environmental issues. We're currently working through a lot of those issues right now. Our hope is to uh, start a unit or start the process and lock a lease in uh, sometime in February is what we would hope. Um, that's where we're at right now. In addition to building a site, what may happen as debris quickly gets moved, um, there's always the potential too at some point to look at, can we put one adjacent to your property if there's space there, so as you rebuild, it's closer to your property. That's, we've done that in other disasters, that's an opportunity. Uh, we'll be putting a contract out uh, for units sometime, I think in the March timeframe to start shipping them over from the United States. My guess is um, it's going to probably be some time before we get here and have them built, and I'd probably guess sometime in June. It just takes that long to put the infrastructure in, prepare the land, meet all the code requirements here, make sure we have fire protection, all those kind of things. We don't want to put anyone in jeopardy. So uh, 
but it will take some time. But we'll update you through this over time. On the west side? Yes, on the west side is our primary focus, yes. Aloha, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark. Ma, I like only to know if, who on the island on that side. Because I think nobody stayed on that uh, island. Why not throw the, the prison that island? That's a little suggestion. And second, if the hotel kicked me out of my place, can I build a tent by the park? In the, in the park, by the west side? Is it okay? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are you referring to Kaho'olawe? Yeah, no, we're not going to consider that. That place has been through so much already, and we have spent so much time, energy, expense to revive it and to bring it back. It would be probably the worst thing to just pretty much go backwards. Um, we have other alternatives, and that's what we're pursuing. Um, well, you know, this whole issue about whether you can put a tent up in the park. So I just wanted to share that the parks are for everybody's use. The parks throughout Maui are for everyone's use. Whether you want to go to the beach or you want to have a family picnic or you want to have a family party. But we also understand people are trying to find a place to live either nearby a hub or someplace. Some place that they can get help. We, we recognize the balance. Um, and as the county, our parks department, our police department, they, uh, they're all on the, put on the spot about what to do. Because again, the community, a lot of you folks, if, if you're not in that situation, you, you, you may hesitate to go and use the, the parks. And then it becomes, well, free for all. Anybody can go and, and use it. Um, you know, I think the challenge for us is try to find other alternatives for people uh, rather than having to resort to the park. Um, you know, the idea that, well, no one else is using it right now. I'm just going to use it temporarily. You know, we, we get that, the, the hardship. Um, but we're not encouraging that. We wouldn't, you know, we can't, we can't say that that's the right thing to do. And, uh, and you know, if you're coming across from Papalaua, Ukumehame, Oluwalu, you're coming in, you're starting to see some folks that are putting up their tents to, I mean, obviously, we're not giving out any camping permits right now. That's not something we're working on. So we're not ignoring it. We acknowledge it, we see it, but again, it's that delicate balance. People do need a place. Um, you know, a lot of folks that were previously unhoused in Lahaina relied on Front Street to get a meal or to get a, you know, catch a, a generous restaurant or somebody that might give them all, and they don't have that. So we recognize that they, they, need, they need something to help them. Um, I would not recommend the, the parks as an ideal situation, so. Do not say the mayor gave me permission to go put up a tent in the park, because I'm telling you the opposite. Do not do that. But we do see what people are resorting to, and we're going to try to figure that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Shannon? Okay, so um, I think I just have quite just a little bit of a suggestion rather than a question. Um, you know, being in community outreach as well as being involved um, as a person who lost their home, um, navigating through this system is like super harsh. It's a hard thing to deal with. It's super stressful. Um, the continuance of going back and forth and turning in this paperwork and that paperwork and checking in. Um, and so I think communication has like been super lacking. And so I know you said you're going to go talk to your team and like, you know, express to them what we can do to change that. Um, and there's so many advocates out here who are like fighting for people when we hear stories or when we see people, um, you know, who post their stories on social media that they're getting kicked out or whatever it is. Um, and I know there are situations, everybody is not the same. It, it, this is so, such a hard um, thing to deal with. Um, but I think what would make it easier is to let us know how we can navigate the situation better. Um, because I can tell you for myself, with every single Red Cross or FEMA person I've dealt with, they have not been nice. I have felt demoralized, degraded, disrespectful at a place where I'm at my lowest. It's like super harsh and stressful. 
and it also kind of like adds on to like mental health, right? Um, and I know we say this all the time, yada, 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 mental health, but like, I would like to see how we can figure out how to navigate to this stuff. Because I know there's help out there, but I think the bottom people doesn't know what the top people are doing. And so there's not a lot of communication and just letting everyone know. So it would be great that when we come to these meetings, maybe to just give like a simple, like, oh, this is what you can do to make your situation better go talk to your FEMA representative or whatever, but some people don't want to talk to their caseworker. Um, maybe we can suggest to get them to get another caseworker. I don't know, but none of the people I've dealt with have been nice. So, yeah. Um, sure, I'll, I'll take a stab at the first part. So I'm one of the nice ones, just joking. Um, but I will say that I'm really sorry to hear that's been your experience. We have a ton of new local employees that we're continually coaching with things like this. One thing I do want to speak to that's really important, the check-ins with the Red Cross SRT, those are for your wellness. Those are because we typically have everybody in a congregate sheltering space. It's very easy to see if someone is struggling. It's very easy to see if somebody has vacated their cot. So when we ask for those twice weekly check-ins, those are really wellness checks. Those are, hey, do you have enough food? Are you doing all right? In some cases, the Red Cross might be the first and only in-person conversation somebody has. So to that point, the check-ins are very, very important. We have 5,100 some odd individuals in the temporary emergency shelters almost six months in. This is unprecedented. We very much are all learning together. None of us, I don't think, expected to be in this situation at this point. So Shannon, I'm gonna come follow up with you because when I hear of people not being compassionate or professional or polite, I want names because I want to follow up on that because that's not what we represent. Our mission is to alleviate human suffering in the aftermath of disasters, period. That's the only reason many of us are here and that's why a lot of members of your community stepped up to work in these shelters. So if they're not fulfilling that mission or if they're working counter to that mission, like I said, I, I, want, I would like more information on that. And if anybody wants to speak to the rest of the process, I can't, I don't really speak to the other processes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to quickly say, uh, again, that's not the relationship we want to have. We want to be uh, here to help during uh, a very difficult time. Um, and so for that, um, you know, that should be, you know, what people are experiencing. Um, as far as the process and, and the question you asked, you know, after that part was, um, how can you help the process? So we do have 1,500 rental properties we've secured. We are quickly trying to lease people into those. So my ask is, when you get a call from us, be responsive to that call. We have time for people five, 10 times over a week or two weeks to try to get to them. Second thing they're gonna ask you to do is they're gonna talk to you about your situation, your family composition, to make sure the number of rooms still works. And then there's a requirement to fill out a background check and that's for the property owner, not us, the person we're leasing from. And so the quicker you fill that out, the quicker we can move you into that unit. So really we want to be responsive to you. We want to, if I could fill all 1500 tomorrow, I'd, I'd love to do that. That's what I want to do. That's what our team is here to do. Uh, what I would ask from your, from, you know, those that are displaced, we've probably sent everyone a letter or an email that's eligible for direct housing by now. And, uh, and so uh, reach out to us or we'll be glad to, we're reaching out to you. Um, and I'm just asking for your help in responding to that call and then filling out the background check because it's gonna allow us to help you get to a final solution. Thank you, Bob. We have a question there and then I'll go Okay. I'll keep it short. But first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Mike Tejada, Mike Tejada and his crew, since the day of the fire, has been working tirelessly to keep Lahaina in check and to keep Lahaina running. 
So to all the county workers, um, I'm going to all of them. To everybody sitting in front of me right here, I'm all of you guys. Um, we had a lot of hiccups, eh? I hope we're learning from our hiccups. And if we're not, I'm going to throw you guys under the bus. And I'm going to get on a tank for run over you guys. But, and then Mahalo to Kaliko, because I feel she's one of the only, in my, in my experience, is the only uh, bucket that has actually reached out and got community voices for her to take back to the mayor and the county. So Mahalo, you guys. Uh, the big question for me is, uh, and there's a lot, but once the governor stated that housing was going to be built in Lanio Poco, now, we all know where that, who owns that area. And, you know, as he stated, God was angry. That's why Lahaina burnt down. So take that as you will. I think he's an idiot. But where is this water coming from? That if we are going to house in Lanio Poco, if we are going to build in Lanio Poco, what that suggests to me is that the state has made a deal with the landowner with the devil of West Maui to get water to build these structures and also to facilitate other developments that he wants to get done. The biggest thing for me is water. Now I know uh, the mayor has already heard about it, but also dual meter systems and R1. Can we really make that happen? Um, that is a must because as much as I want to get back to my property and rebuild my home, I do not want to rebuild Lahaina at the safety and the future of our kids, our grandkids, and our unborn grandkids. If we jeopardize their future, we're going to turn around and look at this day, as the brother said over there, that we, we rebuilding Lahaina. We're going to all turn around to the up Lahaina. And I want you guys to understand, West Maui, yeah, is the aquifer for Central Maui, for South Maui, and all of West Maui. So if we screw that up, there is no water source for all of these communities. If you guys screw that up, if there's even a slim chance to screw that up, you're jeopardizing the future of this island and the kids and everybody that lives here, not just Hawaiians, but everybody. So we really need to take that into consideration. Now, what my concern is, in, in as far as the debris goes, I learned about the debris sites back in September. We didn't hear any community input until November. You guys started building right shortly after that, which suggests that this was all planned out. Now, I'm not. I'm not reaching at straws. I'm just. That's what it looks like. Now I proposed a plan, and I don't know if it got to the mayor. And the plan was, let's keep the debris site in the burn zone. The Lahaina Mill is already a contaminated area. We should have left the debris site there, the temporary debris site. Now I know a lot of surfers ain't gonna agree with me, but DLNR has to dredge Lahaina Harbor anyway. We dredge that harbor and we get that material out of state. Now, I just thought about an idea tonight. If, if you guys are willing to even entertain the idea, why can't we get the ash pile to Oahu and fire it up in each power and just burn it? We don't have to go far. We load it up at Lahaina Harbor so we're not encumbering traffic. We're not putting anybody else in danger. And we just ship it off to each power if that's a feasible idea. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for keeping that short, Jeremy. That was, the, that was the short one. So I'm just going to talk about a couple other things. Um, you don't have to be from West Maui to care about West Maui. Um, all of us care about the same things, I promise you. We all want clean water. We all want futures for our children, our grandchildren, or else we wouldn't be doing this. We all want that. We're asking for you guys' help. Yeah, government is asking community, uh, like you always do, to help us step into this. The temporary debris site is a different 
is a different, um, what do I say, discussion than the permanent site. So yeah, we got on it right away because it was urgent because we needed to do it right away. We had a limit, we had a time, a window to work in to get uh, FEMA and the core to help us do that right away. Um, I don't regret that we we acted quickly. It wasn't something that get a lot of input on. Because again, it's just temporary, the whole idea. Now we did consider that for the, for the uh, permanent site. And I think that's the part you have a legitimate discussion about because it seemed obvious that that could happen. But I think what's important is that we listen to the community after they talk to us. Whatever the timing is, whether it was early, late, or otherwise, we listened. And we weren't going to do that final site until that was discussed and vetted. But the temporary site had to be done sooner than later. Uh, kind of see it as maybe as an emergency surgery versus an elective surgery. There was something that needed to be done right away um, for the best, for the good of everybody here. Um, I did want to say this before I answer the other thing about Lonnie Popo, and I'll turn it over to State DHS, DHS uh, Joe Campos, when I'm done. Um, you know, the Army Corps of Engineers, they talked about, I think, clearing 21 lots as of now. But what you should know is there are up to nine teams of clearing, and they're working their way up. I think 15 by next week, 25 to 30 ultimately. So they're moving as quickly as possible. And again, the whole idea was to get, get that cleared as, as, as soon as possible. So I just give a, I want to give a shout out to CORE because what you're seeing now is just the early stages. They're going to double that, triple that. Um, they learned a lot from Kula about what to do. Um, I'm not saying anything is perfect. And you, you use the right word, hiccups, mistakes along the way. I think what's important is that we learn from those that we have been. Um, you know, we keep looking for that playbook. No more on playbook. We write in the playbook right now as we go. Uh, really, Maui is such a unique situation. Everyone here who has experienced, even the great Bob Fenton, has never seen anything like this before. No one. So we're, we're you know, there's a lot of stuff happening. We're trying to apply things that they do in other fires on the mainland, but they don't apply on Maui. You know, normally, I, I gotta just share this part, the Corps of Engineers, if this was in another setting, like mailing settings, they would just bulldoze that whole thing and clear them out, you know, in a week or two. The reason it's taking long is they're going through each lot one by one. You guys see it yourselves, in some cases by hand, with cultural monitors. They never had to do with cultural monitors before. So I'm just saying this is a very, very unique situation that's we're trying to do it as fast as we can, as safe as we can, without breaking the bank, without, you know, losing our partners. There's just a lot of a lot of that's going on. I'm just gonna say one thing about Lani Opoko, and I gotta I wanna apologize to Kai for my answer last week. I yeah. since um, learned something. That property used to be privately owned. The county purchased it during the Awakawa administration for open space. So that's what the current, it's county owned land. Not the water, but the land. The state has considered that as a location to put up temporary housing. I know that they're reevaluating that as a result of discussions that have happened in the last week. Now, the governor can do what the governor wants to do, um, but I know he's, He's trying to help us. He's trying to help everybody. He's not familiar with all the, the emotions and the passion and the history. So please don't put that on anybody else. Um, some of you folks, I'm learning some of that stuff from you guys, how strongly the sentiment is. So I just want you to know again, just like we listened about Oluwalu, people are listening to that issue. But there's no strings attached here. The county's not promising anything. The state's not promising anything. Or if you give us this, we give you that. I know that's a suspicion. And you have a right to be suspicious about things based on past behavior, but not on us. That shouldn't be applied to us or even the dog or anybody else, because there are people who will take a house there if we put one up, whoever is supplying the water. And there are those that feel strongly against that. And we got to balance that too. Um, everything we, we seem to come up to, there's a, there's a counter to it. Everything we try to move forward, there's something stop and think about our pause. Um, so try not to misinterpret our trying to move quickly as somehow 
some backroom deal or some some other thing that's happening. We just try to move this thing along so we can get people housed and out of hotels and out of short-term rentals and into something hopefully that they would like. But I'm gonna just give Joe a chance. I might have answered most of the questions. Yeah, hi, Joseph Campos, Deputy Director, Department of Human Services for the State of Hawaii. Um, you know, Governor's main priority is to ensure that people have housing solutions and housing options. So back in probably October, the governor tasked the Department of Human Services to come up with a solution for 500 units. We reached out to the county and we discovered that there was this parcel of land that was county owned in Launi Opoko. So we started moving on that. We started site design. And then we discovered that in order to get the water there, we could not tap into county water. It would have to be Lani Opoko Water Company. And so given the feedback that we've been receiving over the last few days, we are reassessing to see if there's another possible site that we can utilize. No backroom deals have been made. And our main goal is to make sure that you guys have options for, for your housing. As we heard from some people a little bit earlier, housing is a major concern. We feel that it is the first step to recovery. And so we want to make sure that we are listening to the community. You guys are the experts, right? You know what the history is. And so we are going to be reassessing and we'll come up with a plan and announce that shortly. But as Mayor said, you know, we are doing things with haste. We want to do it smartly and we want to make sure that you guys have the options that you deserve and you need. Thanks. Thank you for that answer. Sir, your question? Hello. Okay. Hi. Thank you, Mayor, and everybody who take the time to, um, I really appreciate all the uh, <laughs> progress that has been made in the last five months since the disaster and all of us here are, you know, involved with living here five decades myself. So anyway, I was just wondering if the Colonel Army Corps could answer a question about when the properties are cleared, can, how soon will they be able to to start using camping, moving on to it, tiny home, building anything. And uh, I call the uh, planning department and I don't get any response, any email returns. So they say um, apply for your permits sooner the better, but it's like bang, bang, getting nowhere. So. I just need a little bit of uh, answers and that, you know, because I'm living in a pretty comfortable place, but it's not home. Yeah. I want to be back home like everybody else. Yeah, yeah thank you. And I can, I can probably answer the first half of that. Um, just, again, you know, we talked through the process of debris removal, um, and we talked about that, that last step. So once the debris is removed and we test, those tests take seven to ten days uh, to be to come back, and we're working on uh, trying to validate some other methods that could potentially shorten that time. But as soon as that's done, and we've determined that that property is is clear, clean, then we'll consolidate the packet and turn that back over to the county. From that point, included in that packet is a is a letter. It's a certification from the Corps of Engineers and FEMA that says that your property is clear. No additional testing needs to be done for you to apply for your rebuilding permit. Um, depending on where your property is and that particular situation, once, once we've turned that back over to the county, that you know, we no longer have right to, to be on your property. We appreciate that we had it temporarily to get that work done, but it's back to, back to, back to you. So that would be the point where your individual situation for your property and your use for it would probably be a question for the county uh, and what, what they're able to allow you to do. Um, I'm going to ask Josiah to come up. Is it? Okay. Mayor, Josiah is also. Oh, it's, it's... Okay, sorry. Um, 
But I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, when we talk about permit, you're talking about rebuilding your home. One of the things we're hoping to do, and I'm just telling you guys this as a preview, I, I don't know when this is going to start to happen, is if we clear your lots, these modular units or these temporary units that we're bringing in, we're hoping we can put those, if you agree and if you purchase or want. When I say purchase, I mean with the help, um, the county I think is offering $100,000 per unit for accessory dwelling unit and CNHA is offering $50,000. So depending on how much a unit costs, if you just want to get back to your land <clears throat> and if we can figure out the infrastructure, then you can put on a, one of the temporary dwellings. That's what we're hoping to get you guys to as soon as possible. And then of course, while you're living there, you can worry about how to rebuild you know, your, your main dwelling. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about the, uh, I was reminded when the Colonel was talking is that the quicker we can decide on the final disposal site, the quicker we can ship the debris straight to the disposal site. We don't have to stop at the temporary. The temporary is obviously what it sounds like for now because we don't have anywhere else. But let's say we get up and running and we can and get that place going. We can take the debris and truck it straight to that site. So that's another thing we're trying to do to help move it. But this is Josiah, he can talk about the expedited uh, permit. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for the questions. Um, a, a lot of the information uh, was covered already. Of course, each individual situation is so unique. So, um, you know, we'll just talk kind of broadly. But um, specifically to uh, like individuals being able to rebuild on their property, things of that nature. Um, we did cover this in some of the previous community meetings, uh, but we are evaluating uh, a ven vendors at the moment. Uh, we hope to make a selection by February 16th to help us with the expedited permitting process. Um, there's likely, I think our initial estimates is maybe around 1,200 properties or so that may qualify for the expedited permitting process. We'll have further information that we'll share with the community at a, at a later point, but we are hoping to stand that um, emergency permitting or expedited permitting office up in Lahaina uh, by the end of March, uh, possibly uh, into April. So that's kind of a schedule that we're hoping for. And uh, individual property owners will be able to uh, go through the permitting process as well as start construction while uh, we're working on restoring utilities to the property. So depending on your individual situation, uh, water or wastewater service may or may not be available at the time that your property is cleared. Uh, we, we will work with the property owners to uh, help rectify that situation as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Josiah. What a wonderful way to end the Q&A session with the question about going home. Uh, we have assembled an outstanding array of support folks got every alphabet suit, EPA, FEMA, AOC, the red box. Um, for we have our county directors, members of the mayor's cabinet here, and of course, your very own woman advisory. At this time, our team will remain here uh, for the night. We appreciate tonight's uh, work. Some of you will be sitting on those metal chairs for two and a half hours. I don't know how you do it. Uh, but we mahalo you and Mayor. Would you like to um, close out tonight and mahalo everyone? Hold on. Wait, wait. I don't know what I'm on this way, so nothing will be on online. Okay, again, just mahalo. Mahalo to all of our partners that come to all of these meetings, the, the folks that are working out on the field for us and with us, all the use, of, the, use the car engineers folks and FEMA, EPA, all the folks. Thank you guys so much. I hope this was a beneficial night for everybody. I just wanted to thank again our advisory team, these volunteers out here who've been doing all this work, and all of our experts who are here every week. You don't see them, but they're in Kula on Tuesday nights, and then we come here on Wednesdays. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you. Please, if you have an individual situation, let us know about it. So to report on someone who has violated their tenant, uh, the email address is hawaiiag at hawaii.gov. OK? I see nobody writing them down. OK, that's all right. Hawaii dot, hawaiiag at hawaii.gov and that's who you communicate with for that thank you everybody drive safely aloha we'll see you next week